What's going on, guys? Welcome to the latest episode of Can I Kick It? This is your host, as always, Elliot Barton is joining me as my good man. Ned Duran II. And we are back in the lab. I mean, you can say we're back in the lab, right? Yeah, we're back in the lab. <laughs> Cooking up some more episodes. <laughs> okay, I mean, look, man, we took a long hiatus from Can I Kick It? So it's, I think it's time to overload people with episodes of Can I Kick It? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, it was a busy season with the... Uh, with the Richmond it's a jam Kickers. Compact season. Yeah, I just had to <laughs> cram all those games in there. So, hey, what you gonna do? Right. So, for those who missed it, um, we just dropped an episode with Mr. Hugh Roberts to so go check that out. And a Richmond Kickers player. Right. <laughs> and an episode of Marcus Ratchard. Um, and today we have another episode from another person from England. I feel like both of us, eventually, we're gonna get away from the USA and England. But that's where the majority of black players seem to be at. Right yeah. Now? I mean, well, I mean, we got the. Yeah, they, they all seem to pass through England or the USA, basically. Some are in France, but it's a lot harder to find their story. Exactly. Yeah. So, but today we are talking about the one, the only, the first female black captain of England, Mary Phillip. Yes. That's what we're talking about. And all right, so before we really dive into like how she got started and everything, how was it trying to? How was it for you trying to find information on her? Like pulling teeth. Okay. It was. It <laughs> was. A, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I mean, it's. I I personally think it's. It's not a good shout. How very little information you find on a lot of these great. Uh, yeah. let's, let's be honest let's be honest you don't find so much on so these great women athletes or women characters it's just not there no. I mean we struggled with the same thing when we did Wendy Renard and she's current and recent and playing right now and you would think you know especially with the most recent women's world cup how big that was that you would get more information on her but it's Appar- hard to find. Apparently, according to the internet, women's soccer started in, like, what? 2018. Yeah, 2018. <laughs> like, honestly, she played a full career, played for multiple big teams. And it's like, even her Wikipedia, where we're now, she's the head coach. She's the head manager at Peck Town, which is, like, the Levitar in England. Her Wikipedia page don't even reflect that. I'm just like... Not really, yeah. All the stuff she did for England, everything she transcended, like... Once again, if this was a male player, you wouldn't hear the end of it, you know. Yeah. And the you'd, fact you'd, you'd be bombarded with stats yeah. and and history and all of that. And it's not like she's just this average, you know, center back. Like she was a key player in the Arsenal size, the Fulham size, won multiple doubles and trebles. Won, you know, the Arsenal team that she played on won uh, a UEFA Cup. I mean, UEFA Champions League, and it's like. They, and they pulled a quadruple that year. Yeah. And it they even talk won about. almost every single piece of silverware you could win in a season. And the fact that she doesn't even get, like, even real proper, res- proper respect is is damning in itself. Yeah. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to give her her flowers. Today. Oh, definitely we are. <laughs> definitely we are. We're going to have fun with it, too. Right. So, like <laughs> I said, she was England's captain until, you know, England's first female black captain. She was a captain until... Um, 2011, mm-hmm. and she was the only player until 2011 to represent the team in two World Cups. So, yep. the, and and it's it's crazy because I think in between that time, she didn't she have she had her two sons. Yeah, and she was still playing. Like she took a break from playing for the national team. She was still playing regular football, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a, a funny story about her. Uh, Head coach at the time at Fulham, mm-hmm. I believe. Was it Fulham? I think it was Fulham. About how she was like, she was ready to come out to the game at halftime because her son, her the coach was like holding her son, yeah. and her son was just crying, 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 and she was like, "Coach, take me out, like so I could take care of him." She was, and the coach was like, "No, I got him. You keep playing because I need you in defense." <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, you know, it's really like that moment there that kind of. 
allowed her to feel like, all right, I can really do this. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, she, having two kids, probably if you're a male or woman, like, having two kids at that age, yeah. like, that would derail a lot of people's careers. Exactly. You know, I mean, and you, you, you see sometimes a slight dip in form from even male players when it's like, oh, so-and-so had a baby. And it's like, yeah, next couple of games, they're going to be a little slow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not even like in a men's game where you have the income to kind of like, oh, I could go get a nanny. Like, in the women's game, especially during this time period, most people aren't even getting paid. Exactly. Let alone can afford to get a nanny, you know. And proper benefits, you know, prenatal care, things like that. Who knows if that stuff is being taken care of? And the fact that, like, she's able to still be a key figure in these sides is, is impressive in itself. Yeah. You know, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So she played for Millwall, Lionesses, Fulham, Arsenal, Chelsea. So she had the full uh, London experience. Uh, yeah, to say. Like, she said, I'm staying in London. Yeah. Just <laughs> full London experience. Um, She joined Millwall Ladies at the age of 12. And then she moved to Fulham as a pro in 2003. So, this whole time period, like, she's like, all right, I'm going to now go play pro, which is like a step up. Plays a little bit better, but it's kind of like, I can see it where she was like, how can I say this? At this time period, it's not like, she's like, all right, I'm going to go from my small local club in, like, the backwoods country of England. Mm-hmm. To move. It's like literally she's just moving across the street. Yeah. But she had to go to another club to go pro. It's like, you know, this is where the women games was. It's like, even though Lil Wad this time was like, you know, I think championship maybe. I don't think they were Premier League. No, they haven't been Premier League. I think they were championship like League One. Yeah. But the fact that their women's team is not even pro is kind of like indicative in itself of like, she has to move to another club to move pro. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it's it's strange because when you look at her career, I mean, it's basically all of it's coming full circle. But you see a lot of, you don't see a lot of like crazy jumping around as you do with some other professionals. Because it's like, you, you you get this situation where she's spending at least four years at any club. And that's the one thing out of her career, I would say that is... The most abs- the most abna- out, uh, abnormal thing I can't talk right now. <laughs> abnormal thing I've seen because most of the women careers that we look at, Crystal Dunn, you know, Winnie Renard, the women we've done so far, yeah, it's pretty much stayed at one club. You might get another move to another club, but it's like I'm there for six to seven eight years because yeah. of what I don't want to say. There's a ceiling in women's football. Well, it is a ceiling. It's just in terms of like transfers and money moves. So it's like. Once you find that job... You keep it. Yeah, you keep it. You yeah, exactly. Move. And in her case, it was, well, I'm going to go here. I'm going to stay here for a little bit of time. I'll go here, stay here for a little bit of time. I'll go here, stay here for a little bit yeah, of time. Yeah, I mean, she she treated it like a, a regular career, like you would see with a lot of the, the men's careers. But let, let, it's like you said, like when we were talking about Wendy Renard, Wendy Renard stayed with Lyon for... It, it's, she still is with Lyon. Yeah. And then you have uh, Crystal Dunn, who... I mean, basically, <laughs> stayed in New York. Like, so, with her, yeah, she's staying in London, but you can also equate it to just the vast amount of clubs that there are in England. Because, I mean, I, you can't throw a stick without hitting a professional soccer stadium in London. Like, <laughs> like it's, it, there's so many clubs, like, in, with regards to all of the tiers, there's so many clubs in London. And most of them have a women's team, so it, it the the options were there. But like you said, it's not normal to see a woman just moving from this club to this club to this club yeah. to this club to this club. No one does this. Like I haven't seen it, you know. And this is like my only experience. Like someone that is getting into women's soccer, yes, and into it in the terms of like I'm trying to understand like how stuff moves and understand like it's. Totally different than men's soccer. Yes. So, like, seeing a player like Mary Phillips move from club to club, you know, it's like, oh, okay. But then also, it's like, we we really look at her career. I don't even want to count the Chelsea year because she was at Chelsea less than six months. Yeah. It's really like, for her, it's like Fulham, Arsenal. 
Yeah. And that's like the move I'm like, I'm at the small club and now I'm going to make the move to the big, bigger club. Bigger club. Yeah. And while she was at Arsenal, she was a part of the trouble winning team in 2003 where she lifted the FA Women's Cup, the FA Cup, I mean, my fault, the FA Cup, the League Cup, the Premier League, and oh, she also scored 13 goals that year yeah. as a center back. As a center, <laughs> 13 goals as a center back. Either yeah. your team is winning a whole lot of corner kicks. Or you just have that freedom to push up the field yeah. and just do some crazy. It's my fault. That wasn't at Arsenal. That was at Fulham. That was at 2003. Time, time at Fulham. So even at Fulham in this time where it's like, when you hear the name Fulham, you think, what well, we think about the ministry. You think about <laughs> Yo-Yo Club. Yeah. <laughs> struggling. Full America. Totally different than the woman's side. Yeah. <laughs> they are full-blown Brits. And they're like, we're winning trophies. <laughs> It, which is crazy because it's like you would think that a team that's winning the treble, you would think like some substantial money is coming in to be like, hey, we're reinforcing this team, but it's not the case. No, and she has to leave to for greater pastures at Arsenal because I hate to say it, Arsenal was actually playing people, yeah, and actually putting money into it. Yeah, which I, they were actually training, they were actually paying them, they were actually treating them like professional soccer players, the way they're supposed to be treated. I feel that Fulham, being a smaller club in general, is just struggle to keep up with the, you know, with yeah. the Arsenal and the Chelsea's and the Manchester United and Manchester Cities of the world. At the same way with the men's, I mean, you see it now. I mean, the last time Fulham were a mainstay in the Premier League, Clint Dempsey was there, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was a while ago. A while ago. So, after four years at Fulham, uh, she left to go to Arsenal. This is where she, I really think she hits the height or that she's in the prime of her career because yes. she becomes the heart of that defense with uh, Faye White. And that defense is, I, oh, I want to compare it. it. It feels like it's the bad boys Pistons defense. Basically. Mixed in with like that 2000 Ravens defense because yeah. they were... D- d- no nonsense. <laughs> they just <laughs> and no. also also imagine <laughs> imagine this as an Arsenal fan. In the men's side, you have the invincible Terry Henry, uh, Soul Campbell, the pretty soccer, the, 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 the Arsene Wenger, and yeah. then in the women's side, you have this gritty Smash Mouth like knock yeah. them dead <laughs> defense. It is too, <laughs> co- it's too total contrast. It, it is, it is. It's crazy, and it it it, it shows you like how it, it, it's it's funny because you you see that at a lot of these English clubs with the contrast with the style that the women play as opposed to the style the men play. It's it's weird. It, to me, I, I would think you know a club has a philosophy whether men or women it's the same philosophy. No, no. Smash Mouth versus Pretty Soccer. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's two totally different things, man. So why at Arsenal? Um, she won. She wins a Champions League, a Premier League, and an FA Cup. Now this is where I have my gripe with Arsenal. Your women's size wins a Champions League, a Premier League, and an FA Cup. During that time period, your team fails to win a Champions League, fails to win a Europa League. Yet, I don't see a statue outside. For that women's side at all. I don't uh-huh. know if there's like a little memorial or a plaque or something. But there needs to be something outside for that women's they, side. There definitely does. <laughs> because I think that year they also got the quadruple. I think that's another. there was another trophy. That oh, there's the multiple year. quadruples and trebles and doubles in Marie's. I mean, Marie. God, Mary's career. Yes. <laughs> this is what we get for talking about Marie Antoinette before this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, there's multiple doubles and trebles quadruples in her career. Like, I think she walked away with 30, uh, 21 trophies total in her career. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. So she was a habitual winner. And and that's that's crazy because her career literally spans from like probably around like 2000, 2002 to 2008. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. You you did that much? <laughs> oh, dominating. Dominating. Yeah. So, 2004 to 2008, she's at Arsenal winning trophies left right center. 2008, she's like, all right, I'm going to take one more move, go to Chelsea. And this is where Chelsea starts. I, I don't 
I didn't see an article on it because once again, it's hard to find articles on it. But my speculation is this is where the Abramovich money comes in around 2008. Yeah. And I feel like that only they want to prop up the men's side because that's what you hear a lot about. But I also like they want to put money into the women's game, women's side of it. Yeah. And why not go out here and go get kind of create your own Galacticos and be like, let's go get the best defender from in London, put her here. But she doesn't stay long. She only like she retired in October. After signing over the summer. And I, I couldn't figure out if it was due to injury or just... She was just like, eh, I feel like moving on. But that's what it, it just felt like one of those things where you just know, like, all right, this isn't for me. Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Elliot. I know you guys are really enjoying this real unique story. Um, but we got to pay bills around here. So, you know, make sure we provide you guys with more unique episodes. So, the sponsor is from the Non-League America who has been exploring the diversity of the United States through the lens of soccer since 2012. Non League America makes documentaries highlighting ambitious clubs that are pushing the boundaries of what is possible both within the confines and just outside the system, built without their interests in mind. These clubs are building the foundation of American soccer community from the ground up. So, if you support us, go support them. Check out their latest documentary, Non League America, Volume 15, more than ready, the story of Goldsboro Strike Eagles FC on Facebook or YouTube. And also make sure to follow them and Non League USA on Twitter or on Facebook. So, with that being said, here's back to the episode. One thing I do think played a big factor, like you said, with the, the, the big money coming in, is a lot of times with that big money, you get massive changes. Yeah. And with those massive changes, I'm wondering. Is she getting phased out for the new and shiny? You know, is she is she getting is she getting shunned to the side? Like you're you're part of the old guard. You talk about her time in Chelsea. Her time at Chelsea, basically. See, I don't know because in 2008 she leaves Arsenal to go to Chelsea, and then she just retires in October of that same year. So it's not like she even stayed a full year. I think it was just the thing of. I think on Chelsea's part, it was let's go get this great defender. To bring in almost like how Chelsea's doing with Thiago Silva, you know this. Yeah, he knows everything. He's won everything. He helps out our defense. We're trying to become one of these elite teams in London. We're trying to be one of these elite teams in Europe. Yeah, why not go ahead and get the best defender in our own city? And I, I there's no way to prove it. I can't tell if it's just because of she's just like. Eh, I got the check. It's clear. I'm gonna retire. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. I or the thing of is like she because just knows her body. She's just like, all right, I'm gonna step away. And also, we're gonna get more into like what she's done post career. But one of the like she had the opportunity to coach Millwall's women. Her home exactly. where she started off at, and she didn't take the opportunity because she was like, I want to spend more time with my kids. And she had two kids very early in her career, which kind of hampered her international career. So I'm wondering that might also be the reason why we didn't see her play more at Chelsea because she's like, my kids are getting older. Yeah. You know, I hate to say this, but it's the truth of the matter is in the women's game, it's a lot harder to stick around in the game because the pay might not always be there. Whereas in the men's game, you can supplement like, once again, I can pay for an nanny. I can pay to have a stay at home, you know, yeah. spouse. Exactly. The women's game. I'm imagining her in this time. She's <laughs> you'd be lucky to see a ninety k check, you know, yeah. year round. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I think it's probably after her her retirement, shortly after that, maybe a couple of years after that, that you really kind of start to see when the the women getting paid a little bit more than you know than what they were being paid when around the time. But I feel like when you when you compare it back to, you know, they talk about, you know, the old the, the, the old times in England where, you know, you were working a job and playing for your club at the same time and stuff like that. I don't think we're too far removed from that in the women's game around the time when, when Mary Phillip is, you know, doing yeah. her thing. So it's It's like, not like how it is now where you have, like, um, a lot like Rose Lavelle moving to Manchester City and she's making a like a substantial bump in income. Like, exactly. And, like here in, in the NWSL, from what I understand, she was making good money. Exactly. And then she exactly. moves to England and to make even, even better money. Exactly. Whereas in the case of Mary, it was like, you're making 
decent money, but it's like, all right, I have to choose exactly, exactly. what I want. It's not like I can do both. So that, that's from my understanding of it. And I, look, I do not discredit Mary at all, a hundred percent. Like, do do what you got to do. Exactly. Do what do do what needs to be done for for you, for yeah. your family, and whatnot. But I mean, at the end of the day, the story's not over though. After she retires, oh, no. so no. I mean, you you get this situation, this extremely rare situation where you have a woman coaching and managing a men's pro team. Yes. Um, Peck she, Town FC. So she goes back home to Peckham Town. Up the pecs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the best, but I feel like it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's the um, head coach of Peck Town FC, which is in the count, Kent County League, which I think is the 11th division in U.S. So- and not U.S. soccer. God, we don't have, we can't even get past three before we start having fights. In the yeah. 11th division in England. Um... And she has a very successful career. She just won the London FA, you know, the first yeah. female ever to lead her team to a cup trophy in men's soccer. Yeah. Ever. Um, I think 1920. So, great on her. I don't know how they're doing in the league. That's a little bit harder to find. But yeah, because that's a very, very local league. So, it's not it's not information that's readily that you can just boop. Yeah. Google but in one of the articles that, you know, we saw... Um, she talked about how she was turned away from the coach's interest because they didn't believe that she was the manager. They thought she was just a patron. And she was like, no, I am the manager. And they were like, come on, stop playing. Go sit over there. You're, you're a female. You're not coaching a man. And But she talked about her restraint so much about how like she could have, like, quote, unquote, turned up in that moment and acted like, a, like after her color. And that's something, like, where in our community, where, like, black people, where it's like, we know we have the credentials. We know we have the, you know, everything qualified to get a job. We have the job. But then we get met with that disrespect of, well, you, you don't look like you deserve it. You don't yeah, look, you like, don't look you like you have what, what you yeah. say you have. And she just talks about how she's like, I'm going to do my talking on the pitch with my team. Exactly. If they choose to act ignorant and belligerent, that's on them. I'm going to focus on what I can focus on, you know. And to her, I, I want to give her the utmost credit for that. Because let me tell you something. <laughs> Let that have been our wives. <laughs> everything would have been set on fire. <laughs> Shutting everything down. Because, I mean, and I think that goes hand in hand with the frustration of the of, of what it is to be a black person in America or a black person in England in her case. Because at the end or of the day, it's a it's, black woman in the workplace. It, exactly. It, a black you know, woman like, in the workplace. That's that's a double whammy, it's basically. Tough. And you 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 get that situation of here we go again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's like we should be past the point where that's an issue. And that's what leads to a lot of that frustration, to a lot of that um that angst and that quick to quick to anger kind of demeanor of yeah. black people in England and in the United States. So, I mean, while while a lot of people would say, well, you know, you got to be able to control yourself. It's like at the end of the day, keep pushing someone's buttons and something's going to blow up. You know, yeah. but I, again, like you said, Marie Philip just handled said, OK, you're going to think that. I'm just, just watch, watch what I make this team do. Watch, watch what I accomplish with this team. And I mean, the, the numbers speak for themselves. The numbers speak for themselves. So I'm, I was able to find, so they're in the Kent County, Kent County Football League, the yeah. premier. They're in sixth place. Oh. Yeah. Out of 16. Up the pets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also I found I remember this. Um, her head coach at the time, the story that I was talking about her he, head coach who held her baby while she was playing, um, is Mr. Jim Hicks. Mm-hmm. And Jim Hicks is the reason why she got her coaching badge at seventeen because he told her he was like, "You are a young lady in football, mm-hmm. and there's only so many opportunities. So if you go get your coaching badges now, the doors for you post career are going to open up a lot sooner." And that's what happened. You know, it, it's kind of like that butterfly effect moment. Because what if Hicks 
doesn't tell they're going to coach his manager. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing happening post There's Liverpool. nothing after, after Chelsea. Yeah. You know? And also her international career, which England internationally, I have come to realize, was not a powerhouse as I thought they were. No, and I learned it's only it's only recently, very recently. Yeah, I man. learned that in the 2015 World Cup when I had England going to the final. I realized it. Like, oh, yeah, they're not they're not England. <laughs> <laughs> they were like stack the talent. No, they're not. They're not the men's England. And I mean, they got Even to men's have... England. They ain't men's England. <laughs> no, no. I mean, men's England always gives you hope and dashes it. But at least there is that that hope and and. One thing that we do notice a lot with the England, with England in general, is a lot of times they get into situations where it's like, like for example, you go all the way back to '98. Like they go out in the round of 16 on penalty kicks against an Argentina side that was pretty stacked. Yeah. You have Ortega, Batistuta, Crespo, um, Veron, and so you have an England team that's going toe to toe. With this club, middle of the second half, you're one of your most talented players gets a red card and sent off, and you still hold them two to two and go all the way to PKs. I mean, and you you see that kind of push itself throughout the the World Cups after that, but the women's side, I mean, up until 2018, maybe, yeah, no, up until 20, 2019, it's like. Ee. It was rough. <laughs> yeah. It was rough going, but it's it's been a complete, like, massively quick turnaround. But even then, from Marie Phillip to to captain the England national team, that's a big shout. That's a big shout because you're still talking about the country where this game was born. And she received her first call up at in the ninety five World Cup when she was eighteen. Eighteen years and old. And she started and, and this is the thing. You will usually hear about okay, yay, eighteen year old, like who started at eighteen? Michael Owen, um, Wayne Rooney. You cats like that who are let's be honest, your job go score a goal. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to be capped for the national team at eighteen as a center back that is a big deal because usually in that position, you're not looking for youth and vitality and flair. You're looking for experience. And for at 18 to have the maturity and experience for the head coach to be like, I want her in my back line. She's 18. Yeah, yeah, but still, I want her. That's a big deal. That's a very, very big deal. And look, it wasn't until 93 that the FA started taking over women's football. Yeah. You know, so that's like, you know, it, it's weird to look at the development of women's football where it was to now we're kind of getting into. And we're probably not going to see it. Maybe our kids, when they're like our age, are going to see like, wow, how much it's grown. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to realize when you're in the moment. But like I said, 18, she receives a call um, to be in the 95 World Cup from 90 to 2002. She doesn't play an international game at all because she's like, I'm about to have. I'm having kids. <laughs> Need to take care of them. Yeah, I got. I gotta. I gotta get back from have, from giving birth to kids. Like yeah. that's that's a that's a thing. <laughs> but even when she returned in 2002, she's at full first, and she plays at the All Grey Cup, and has a wonderful time, and goes on to play more more. So, that's pretty much the wrap up of Mary Phillip, and yeah. I feel like her story. I, I don't know who do you who are you related to? I mean I I don't know because that that's a very unique story. It's a very unique story, especially yeah. with the career that not really having any ups and downs. It's just success, success, success. I'ma retire. Now I'm a coach. I'm gonna go back home and coach my home team. And it's like it's like that go on the road and come back home completely untouched kind of and it's 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 actually impressive because you see players go through areas periods of their career where they're you know falling out of favor or and and I think that may be why uh Mary decided to retire when she did because she said I'm look quit while you're ahead 
<laughs> and just, just you know, I'm, I'm going to hang it up while I still have it. She did not pull a Michael Jordan. <laughs> no, she did. But I mean, also, it's like, in the women's game, you're not going to see, at that time period when she retired, it's not like you were going to see a, a huge signing day. Yeah. You know, they probably some thing. I was like, all right, look, I can probably make more money coaching. I can have more time to be with my kids. Yeah. Why not? Exactly. So, and I mean, just I just wanted to end it on a quote from the Peckham goalkeeper George Legg. Um, he said, "I don't really think about whether Marie is male or female. She's got loads of experience, so regardless of her gender, it doesn't matter to us. She's great." No. Those those are the words from Peckham's goalkeeper. Um, so that just lets you know that she transcended that, you know. The, the gender, yeah. the gender issue. She's, it's like, it doesn't matter that she's a woman. She's doing a great job coaching this team, managing this team. And you know the other thing is that's crazy? That 95 World Cup team was the first time England made its own World Cup. Yep. Wow. First time. Yep. So she's part, like, she, like you said, she's part of history. Also, I forgot 2015 England made it to the third, uh, we're third place. That was my first time I ever watched it. A yeah. World Cup, which I loved it. Yeah. So, anything else you might good man before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. I think we we have definitely delivered the flowers. Yeah, I think her story. Not the more I think about, it, I think her story is one of taking talking about the community, but overcoming so many hurdles that could obviously tripped her up. Yeah, and it did. They so. didn't. She she just coasted right through all of it. So, well, with that being said, guys, this is Elliot. This is Shanir. We'll catch you guys on the good side. As always, remember to like, share, subscribe to this podcast. Um, go check out our previous episodes. These are timeless episodes. You can listen to them whenever. It's not like, you know, after a week you miss it and you don't feel like you're going to catch up. Listen to these episodes on your run, your walk. Share it with a friend. Um, also, share it with another black person. Definitely. Just randomly go to them and tell them, like, hey, look, you like soccer? You like black people? That might be a little bit awkward. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it could go wrong so many ways. But yeah, share it with a friend. Um, and we catch you guys in the next one, guys. Holla at you later.